Hi guys, nice to see you all again. Mr. Martin here. Thank you so, so much for joining me. Now today, what we're going to be looking at is the first of our theories into memory. Now it's very likely in your final exam you'll be asked to explain memory in terms of an approach or maybe in terms of a theory. So this theory here is a very, very simple one to write about. So it's one you want to really process and get into your heads. This is a model of memory. A model is a framework. It helps us to understand how memory works and perhaps more importantly what it cannot account for. And the first one to be devised, arguably the most simple but very very influential, was the multi-store model. So let's see what this has got to say about the framework of memory. In the late 1960s, Atkinson and Schifrin, two very, very influential psychologists, start to really reject this idea that memory is simple. It's not so much about having shelves inside your mind that you can walk up to and select memories from. There is much more to it than that. So they knock their heads together and this is what they come up with here. This is the multi-store model. The reason they called it that is because it's made up of a series of different stores. The sensory memory to start, the short-term memory, and then the long-term memory. Now, they would argue that all memories flow from left to right in this, uh, in this model. So we start with uh, information on the outside, something you want to remember. It goes into sensory, then STM, then long-term memory. Each store you can think of as the gateway to the next. So information must start outside the body, it must go into sensory, then it must go short term, then it must go long term. Let's explore this a little bit better. So if we put this model up to the top and we'll have a look at sensory memory to start off with here. Sensory memory is a very, very brief snapshot of the world. Now you know this yourself. When you are standing talking to someone and you start thinking about something else, mind starts to wander. What am I gonna have for tea tonight? Or what did I forget to do? Then all of a sudden you are brought back with an absolute bump back into reality. Now you will still process the last maybe second of what your person, what your friend is saying to you. You can't recall much more than that, but there's definitely something left there. So for example, if, they, uh, if you remember uh, an upwards inflection, you might think that it's uh, a question, or you might remember that it's gonna be something funny, so you might laugh. It kind of gives you the impression that you were paying attention all the time. So what Sperling in the 1960s is really pointing out here is that there must be a very, very small, very, very short memory, even above and beyond short-term memory inside your head. Now he does a few experiments and he kind of points this out. It's very small, it can only hold roughly 12 items and it's very short as well. A second, maybe even less than that. But the whole idea here is that there is so much uh, information in the outside world, your brain couldn't possibly hope to remember everything. So rather than do that, it just holds a very brief snapshot um, of everything around it, and then it's very quickly lost. So how does the mind decide on what gets taken into the mind further? How do you decide what you actually want to remember? Well, you pay attention to it. So hopefully you're paying attention to my voice. So rather than just passively letting it flow over you and only really recalling the last second or so of what I'm saying, you're listening to it with a little bit more attention and hopefully it's passing into your short-term memory. Short-term memory has a huge amount of evidence that says that it exists and we know a lot about it. For example, Conrad tells us that the short-term memory is acoustically encoded. So it's the sounds that you listen to. Badly says more or less the same thing. Miller tells us it's got a very small capacity, seven items, plus or minus two. And Peterson and Peterson in the late 50s tell us that short-term memory doesn't last very long, longer than sensory memory, about 18 seconds this time, but certainly no longer than that. Now, all these researchers point out that as soon as you stop thinking about information in your short-term memory, then it is destroyed, it gets lost, you forget it. So in the 1960s, Glanzer and Kunitz put together a really, really nice study, very simple, but very um, evocative. We can actually tell a huge amount about the multi-store model based on their work. Basically what they do is they read out a big long list 
to people, a list of items, a list of different things. It's 20 items long, far bigger than could ever be remembered in any one person's short-term memory. Then they ask them right at the end of the list, okay, tell us all the items on that list. What they find is that most people are able to recall the last couple of items, the last ones to be read out on the list. The idea is that these are still in the short-term memory. They're still floating around in there. They're still being rehearsed. They haven't had a chance to be forgotten yet. You're easy enough to say what they were. The first few items on the list are also well remembered, not quite as well as a short term memory, but still pretty well. The idea is that these have had time to be rehearsed. So these have been passed into the long term memory. So you can remember them with, again, a little bit better um, efficiency. In the middle, however, these aren't anywhere. These are neither in the short term memory, neither are they in the long term memory. So the vast majority of people have no idea. Glanzer and Kunitz seem to point out here that there is definitely a short-term memory, there is definitely a long-term memory, but there's nothing in between, just like Atkinson and Schifrin tell us. Very interesting. Other psychologists have focused very much on the rehearsal, so we know that information would be very, very quickly forgotten if it's not rehearsed. Well, what does rehearsal even mean then? Craig and Watkins in the 1970s put together a huge amount of different studies doesn't really matter what they did, but basically what they tell us is two things. There is a type of rehearsal in your mind, in your short-term memory, called maintenance rehearsal. This is very, very simple. Say I give you a phone number to remember, and I ask you to dial it into a phone. Now you remember that just long enough so you can put it in to your phone's, uh, to your phone's memory. What you do to remember that is you consciously Repeat it back to yourself. So you would say, oh, 7117, whatever it is, okay, again and again and again and again. So you're maintaining that number or that item inside your mind and you're making it more likely that you rehearse it. Doesn't work that well. It's sometimes likely you'll make a mistake, but it works okay. The better way to do it is something called elaborative rehearsal. And this basically involves putting bells and whistles on whatever you want to remember. So, for example, do me a favour, I want you to go and pick up my cousin, uh, his name is Paul, uh, he's going to be at Edinburgh Airport tomorrow at nine o'clock. Now, if I said that to you once and you were distracted, you'd very quickly forget that. However, if I give you more information, you're more likely to remember. So I say, hey, do me a favour, tomorrow at nine o'clock, Edinburgh Airport, I want you to pick up my cousin Paul. He's a multi-Oscar winning actor, he lives in Los Angeles, he owns a jet, he's a billionaire, uh, he's very, very handsome and uh, he drives a Ferrari. Now, you're more likely to remember that. Even though I've given you more information, it's elaborate. There's more meaning to this cousin, whatever his name is, and, uh, and what you've got to do. So you're more likely to remember that. That's elaborative rehearsal there. So we've got this multi-store model then, and it seems to have a fair amount of evidence behind it. Let's evaluate it very quickly, because it seems to be pretty good. In terms of strengths, there's a huge amount of empirical evidence, multiple different studies, Glanzer and Kunitz, Craig and Watkins, and all the different STM and LTM studies we've mentioned already. All of these fit very, very nicely into the multi-store model. Second thing is it's influential. Even to this day, remember this is 1968 this is published, but even to this day, psychologists are still using this to explain a lot of memory processes. So it must still be pretty good. It must be holding up pretty well. And lastly, this seems to be supported by real world people, amnesiacs, people who have lost certain types of memory. So we have some people in the world, people like HM, patient HM, who have very much lost their long-term memory. They cannot process any of their things like their wedding day, the names of their kids, anything like that. Oftentimes their name, their date of birth, they've completely forgotten it. But they still have a short-term memory. They can still function in day-to-day -day life. Alternatively, we do have amnesiacs who don't have a short-term memory. Think about Clive Wearing. He has no idea what's going on in the world around him. He very quickly forgets things, but he still recognises his wife. He recognises photographs of his kids. He can still remember his wedding day. So amnesiacs seem to either lack a short-term memory or they seem to lack a long-term memory, but normally they keep 
the other type of memory there, suggesting that there's only the two that can be inside the mind. In terms of um, weaknesses then, yeah, this is a pretty useful model, but it's very, very oversimplified. There are certain memories that we cannot account for for this. For example, the rules to a computer game, or even just the controls to a computer game. Where are they stored inside there? Is that not a mixture of short-term and long-term memory? What about how to divide numbers together? Do you have a box inside your brain that says, this is how you divide? Well, no, there's a lot of different processes there, especially things like long division, which takes multiple different steps. How is that explained by this model? It's not really, and it can't really be explained. So this is a big weakness one. And secondly here, as every student knows, rehearsal doesn't always work. So if you're sitting and you've got, uh, let's take something that I absolutely hate in biology, the nitrogen cycle. If you've got the nitrogen cycle sitting in front of you, no matter how many times you look at it, how many times you think about it, how many times you rehearse it, when it comes to the exam, pff, gone, straight out your head. So rehearsal seems to be pretty useless sometimes, but pretty um, effective at other times. For example, I can tell you the names of all the original Power Rangers, but I'm pretty useless when it comes to certain very complex bits of biology. Why do I remember some things better, but other things not? In terms of rehearsal, doesn't really tell us why. So it's a pretty good model, but it's not massively useful, very oversimplified. There are better ways to explain things. Okay, guys, so that's all we're going to say about the multi-store model today. Uh, we'll be looking at a slightly different theory, a different model of memory next time. That's going to be the working memory model, which maybe has a slightly better idea of how the whole thing works. But for just now, hopefully that was reasonably helpful for you. Thanks very much for tuning in, and we'll see you again next time. Cheers.